Good morning, Sean. Hey, good morning, everyone, and, and welcome to our presentation today. Uh, this is an update and review of life extension for medium voltage vacuum circuit breakers. Uh, my name is Justin Gaw. I'm the business development manager here at CBS Power Products, which is part of Group CBS. And today we have with us Finley Ledbetter. He's our founder and chief scientist at Group CBS, and he's going to walk us through today's presentation. Just a quick note, uh, if you have questions, feel free to pose those during today's presentation by posting them in the Q&A. You'll find that chat window at the bottom. Uh, we will stop periodically to answer those questions as they come in and as they're relevant. And if we start getting behind, we might push some of those questions till the end, but we'll try to get, get to each and every one here within the hour. And if we have to miss those questions, we'll make a list of those and make sure we email them to you uh, after today's presentation. So. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, today, again, Finley Ledbetter with us. Finley, I'm going to turn it over to you, sir, uh, and, and thank you. All right. All right. Hey. I got a uh, uh, echo. echo. Really bad echo. Do you have any idea where that came from? Somebody else's microphone. Okay, there you go. There you go, guys. Uh, I'm Finley Ledbetter. I'm the chief scientist at Group CBS. And uh, I'm going to be presenting this paper at uh, IEEE, uh, possibly Doble, and at NIDA this year. So if you'd like a copy of the paper, paper reach out to Justin, and we will uh, email you a PDF of it uh, when it's complete, which ought to be here really quick. And uh, today, we're just going to touch, touch the high points. <clears throat> Basically, it's an update and review of our technical paper on life extension. And uh, like I said, if you have any questions, you know, text them in uh, on the chat to, uh, to Justin and we'll try to get to them. Otherwise, uh, we'll get to them at the end with any extra time we have. Otherwise, at the end is my phone number and email address, and you can reach out to me directly or through Justin anytime to go deeper into this. Basically, uh, medium voltage switchgear is definable depending upon what region in the country you went to school. In the Midwest, for instance, they have a different uh, definition of what medium voltage is than they do on the West Coast. But generally to me, medium voltage is 5 kV to 38 kV. Some people reach down to 2400. But in those voltage classes is what we're talking about for medium voltage. The intermediate distribution class that's used throughout your plants and through the, and through the industry. And it's really the lifeblood and uh, the infrastructure that keeps the power on. I, I challenge you to find many circuits, many applications that the energy does not pass through a medium voltage circuit breaker at some point before it's utilized. So, you know, the breakers were first, uh, vacuum breakers were first introduced in the 70s. Now, br vacuum breakers were built back in the 20s and 30s with limited success as far as interrupter rating goes. But in the 70s, uh, GE, Alice Chalmers, uh, Westinghouse, and some European and Asian manufacturers found ways to increase the IC and to pack it into small light mechanisms and build compact vacuum draw out circuit breakers. So in the 70s, you started to see air breaker technology and oil breaker technology fade. Uh, vacuum breakers quickly overtook all the other medias, or, you know, oil, gas, and air. Uh, gas breakers really were uh, a phenomenon in the 80s out of Europe and the SF6 uh, was uh, thought to be a great way to go about it. They're very complex inside. They have a lot of moving parts inside the uh, pole assemblies, um, intermediate contacts, mains, and arcing contacts, just like an air breaker, a lot of springs. So they weren't very simple and they took bigger mechanisms. And then when the EPA decided that the SF6, the sulfur hexafluoride was a problem, the gas breaker for an intermediate or medium voltage breaker quickly went away. There's a lot of them still out there. We do have to address them and from a maintenance standpoint, but you do not see many going into service today in the United States. Uh, medium voltage vacuum interrupters can interrupt uh, current and potential power very quickly at next crossing zero, uh, or at least the next crossing zero. So they're uh, very quick, they're very simple, they're very easy to use. They use very small, very lightweight mechanisms, so they're easy to maintain, and they quickly became, you know, the chosen uh, type of interrupting uh, for the American medium voltage market. You know, they're very long life and low cost of ownership. Now, there, there are some downfalls to the medium voltage vacuum breaker, one of which is, is 
the breaker does typically age out. Uh, it can be maintained and kept in service, but they do age out. Uh, where uh, an air breaker, you can go in and burnish the contacts, clean the contacts and keep them in service forever. A vacuum breaker, eventually the vacuum interrupter will cease, will cease to do its job. Uh, there's been continuous research and development throughout their life. And consequently, uh, you, you've seen a great improvement in the vacuum breaker is a very stable uh, piece of equipment. Now there is no replacement uh, on the design board right now that's close enough to speak about. So these breakers are with us for the immediate future. The immediate future, I mean another 50 years. They've already been in service 50 years. We're gonna have to keep them in service another 50 years. So we're looking at least a hundred year window on the medium voltage breaker. So how do we keep it in service? How do we upgrade it? How do we maintain it? Is really what we're getting about on this paper. And, and uh, you know, I have 40 years of experience directly in that particular uh, problem. This particular timeline chart kind of shows when the breakers were developed, when they came into use and when they, and, and, and when they got real popular. If you look at this in the 20s, you know, in the, in the 30s, in the 40s, there was a tremendous amount of design work being done around how do we increase the interrupting rating of a vacuum breaker to get it to be able to do the job. It was very easy for them to build a vacuum interrupter that would interrupt about 10 kA, about 10,000 amps of AC current. But to get past that point, it took some metallurgy and it took some physics because they could not get past it. They kept punching a hole in the contact with a root. So every time they would try to exceed 10,000 amps, they would essentially punch a hole through the contact, like taking a gouging rod, if you're a welder and gouging through a piece of metal. They came up with a way through a lot of degassing and, and designs to take and create a magnetic field that would cause these roots to constantly move on the contact so they didn't stay in one spot long enough to burn a hole through it. And as easily as I can say it, that's what solved the problem. Basically a, a radial and axial magnetic field design. Uh, the Europeans went with an axial field, uh, Westinghouse with a radial field. GE adopted the Westinghouse patent for the radial field and most of the Europeans are axial field. But either one does the same thing. It causes the arc roots to dance or to move across the contact surface instead of staying fixed in one place and gouging a hole through the contact. And that was really the breakthrough. That and materials that they were able to outgas and get the gases out of the materials to make the gas that materials themselves not contaminate inside the enclosure. Sometime in, in the 70s, what happened was is the major manufacturers, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna pick on GE because they're the big boys. Uh, the GE guy would come to your plant, uh, a steel mill for instance, I'm talking about at this point, Chaparral Steel, Bill Coleman was the gentleman's name in Midlothian, Texas. A uh, GE engineer came to his plant. I happened to be there that day and I heard the spiel. I was a young 25 year old electrical engineer fresh out of school talking about a maintenance situation or a maintenance shutdown with Bill. He said, stick around and listen to what this guy has to say. And the conversation went like this. If you buy these new medium voltage vacuum breakers and replace your old air magnetic breakers, you will not have to maintain them every year. You'll be able to extend your maintenance cycles out to, to 10 or 15 or 20 years because the breaker is designed to operate for 20 years with a minimum amount of maintenance. The other good thing was that it's too high stackable. So you can essentially get twice as many breakers in the same substation uh, footprint that you have now. These were both very attractive alternatives. So what happened was when people started specifying new equipment, obviously they specified the vacuum breaker and the air breaker quickly went away. Now the air breaker did stay and is being used today in certain marine applications and nuclear applications where it is a certified product for and where the vacuum breaker is not certified. So there are still a few air breakers built across the world, but very few. So what happened was, so in the seventies and eighties, it immediately switched to where 90% of the new equipment was vacuum breakers. So all the installed base since then has been vacuum breakers. Then a certain amount of people have gone back and, and updated or upgraded their vacuum gear, either by roll-in replacements, retrofits, replacing the old breaker, keeping the old switch gear, or simply taking the switch gear out completely and installing new vacuum gear. So through all of that, I would estimate that about 50% of the medium voltage equipment in the United States today is vacuum and about 50% of it is air. 
A very small portion of it is still oil and gas, I would say three or 4%. That's primarily in explosive atmospheres and in places uh, in the Southeast in the textile industry where they're still using a lot of oil breakers, refineries and explosive atmospheres, that sort of thing. Uh, but basically the oil breaker was a problem because of the oils and uh, the organic insulation. Typically the insulation was wood or micarta, so it didn't survive very well. Uh, and then the uh, air breaker was a combination of the two. It did have some modern materials in it, but it started with organic insulation and big arc chutes and a lot of asbestos and materials that we didn't want in our plants today. And the vacuum breaker solved most of those problems with plastics and epoxies, uh, fast contact speeds, fast opening speeds, very reliable equipment. Uh, after they got through the first uh, few rounds of design changes, the vacuum circuit breaker has been very reliable. And if you look today at them that are in service 50 years, you've got to say, hey, you've got your money's worth out of this equipment. This chart, I'm not going to go through it in great detail right now, but certainly review it. If you have any questions, give me a call. You know, all these are failure, uh, failure are prone to age, aging out. So everything has a bathtub failure curve. Everything from a TV to your vacuum breaker to your automobile to us as humans have a failure curve. You know, if you operate pretty steadily when you're young, uh, if, if you make it the first few months, you're probably going to make it. If you don't have any infant mortality problems, then you have a long lifetime. And then there is some point where failures begin to come. With the vacuum breaker, that's about 30 years or about 3,000 operations. So when you get a vacuum breaker that has uh, in excess of about 3,000 operations on it, if you make it that far, uh, typically you've got real mechanical problems and uh, electrical problems. If you get to about 30 years old, you start to get all sorts of vacuum interrupter problems and materials problems. So uh, maintenance cycles come into this. We're going to get into that shortly. The life extension of this crazy, inf this, this critical infrastructure is very critical. A well-planned and executed uh, maintenance program and safety program is really something you need to think about. Uh, Reliability-centered maintenance is, the, is key here, and it's become the industry standing. That, that kind of combines all the different mind thoughts as far as maintenance goes. Or you can be like some of you steel mill guys and run to failure when it blows up, we'll hurry around and fix it. Either one works. The economics and dynamics uh, are, are predicated by, by management, but uh, basically reliability-centered maintenance with a maintenance cycle not to exceed about five years. And I'll get into that here in a second. You know, first trip timing, we're going to talk about that first. Okay, that's the first topic we're going to talk about. Gathering that first trip information is critical to understand whether or not your breaker would have performed correctly and if your maintenance cycle is too long. So basically the hardening of the grease, exercising the springs is all a very important part to get the breaker to operate, react to speed. And I'm gonna take a second and, and give you a little definition and explanation on this is most timers and most people look at breakers and they talk about parting time. Parting time is when the contacts first part, okay? So when the contacts first part, that is a very useful time for you because you can take that and extrapolate what probably would it operate within time. A timer with a, a slide wire resistor and also with possibly a rotating resistor can give you velocity, speed, and time to stop. And what that is, is parting time is one number. Then if it's an air breaker, a low voltage air breaker, medium voltage air breaker, the contacts have to accelerate okay, over a period, and then they come to stop, they bounce and stop. When they accelerate across this arc, the arc is essentially bowed. That's how you hear air blast, air magnetic. The air blast is a puff of air that essentially helps push the arc up into the, up into the arc chute to break it up into smaller pieces. If it's a magnetic air blast, it also has a magnetic component that's magnetically bowing the arc while there's an air blast hitting it. That's usually your higher interfering devices. So basically the time involved is uh, mechanical time lost in opening the breaker. Then you have parting time, then you have acceleration, then you have stop and bounce. You have the time it takes to bow and extinguish the arc. And all of that has to operate in a symphony of times to make your arc flash study numbers correct. If any of that is too slow, your incident energy essentially is a, a factor of speed. So if the speed slows down by half, your energy really expands by, by, by a factor of two. 
So it's very important to get these first trip times. They're hard to get. There are ways to do it. What that tells you is if your breaker was called upon to react, clear a fault or save a person or a piece of equipment, would it have acted quick enough to do it? Would it have acted quick enough to have made your arc flash study and then have the correct protection equipment, had your zones to be correct? None of that is correct unless the breaker operates to speed. Once you open the breaker the first time, you lose that data because you've exercised the grease and it's going to operate a little quicker next time. So you really need to try to come up with a way to get first trip, uh, first trip timing as you can to validate your maintenance program. When I say that, what I'm talking about is if let's say you're uh, cl cleaning the breakers, lubricating the breakers on a three-year period, and these times continue to be consistent, maybe you can go to four, maybe you can go to five. If you're cleaning it, maintenancing it on a five-year cycle and your times are slow, then you need to cut it back. Also, you have to look at the particulate in the air, how much contaminants in the air, what kind of a airborne uh, corrosives are in the air. You have to look at your lubricant. Are you using the right grease? There's a million factors that go into that. We can certainly help you with that offline. We've, we've performed uh, a study on 300 uh, medium voltage vacuum breakers to get the correlation between age and the number of operations and speed. 246 breakers actually, and first trip timing was recorded. And we found that as, as at about five years, we started to see uh, times get, uh, get slower. And at seven years, we saw times get to be about 100 milliseconds and greater on most of the breakers. So there's really a, a fall off the curve uh, event that happens at about five years. So please don't try to push your medium voltage breaker maintenance clean lube past about five years, or you're going to get into trouble. And then we do have a question that has come in. Sure. Uh, if the mechanism is operating at the correct speed, and we have studied maintenance consumables, meaning the cleaner, the lubricant, the grease, and has every limited fault operation, or has a very limited fault operation, then cannot the life be anything up to 40 or 50 years, particularly if the switch gear has an internal arc classification? The vacuum interrupter itself may not last 40 or 50 years. If the breaker is a modern breaker, the vacuum interrupters will not live 40 or 50 years. If the breaker was built by certain manufacturers in the 80s, the material sciences and the way they were designed, they have a little longer shelf life than they have today. But the majority of the modern vacuum interrupters are made in, uh, in Asia in China in particular, and there, we have a lot of infant failures with them. We have very high leak rates, and you're not going to get 40 or 50 years out of a modern breaker unless it's made by certain manufacturers. There are some manufacturers that have very long, very low leak rates, and their vacuum interrupters will survive for a longer period of time. The one thing you can do is you can clean, lube, time, and keep the mechanism in service for 100 years. The problem you have essentially is uh, the instrument transformers possibly, the relays possibly, but the real problem you have is the vacuum interrupters. They're not gonna, they're not gonna live that, that length of time. Go ahead. Anything else? Does no, that that's your, that, does that, does that, that answer your question? I, I believe it does um, answer the question. And a couple of people are asking if there will be a CEU or a certificate uh, after this presentation. I will post my email address. If you would like a certificate, we can validate your participation here and I can forward that to you after today's presentation. I think that we have to actually send you out a little test, a little 10 question test for you to take on this content for you to get a CEU on it. You can look into that, Justin. Okay, we'll have to look into that and maybe create that, but thank you, Finley. Uh, you know, these breakers are expected to live within their design life, which is 20 years. Will they live... Uh, with adequate maintenance 100 years, absolutely. Will you have to change or condition the vacuum interrupters in process at least once? Yes, you will. Okay, let's move forward. Uh, how to determine maintenance intervals. Now, uh, there's as many opinions on this as there are stars in the sky. Basically, what you have to think about are these critical circuits. And if they're critical circuits, then you have to take a more critical approach to your maintenance cycle. If they are not critical circuits, you might take a different approach. And in certain industries, the run to fail model is certainly attractive because you essentially uh, 
mount a SWAT team every time you have a fire and put it back in service. And that's a common approach in a lot of industries. Don't think it's not. Uh, there are in the NEDA maintenance, uh, uh, maintenance test procedures, the MITS, there are charts and ways to determine various pieces of equipment and what NEDA recommends for uh, annual, biannual, every five-year maintenance, that sort of thing. The best thing I can do is offer that to you. I do have a paper on maintenance. There are a lot of them out there. If you go and, and search uh, through the Doble, NEDA, and IEEE papers on uh, electrical maintenance procedures, I think you have to consider the risk of losing a particular circuit. Certainly, there are financial factors. In fact, uh, how, how, mu how much money will the plant or your boss allow you to spend on the breaker? It's something we probably have to take offline here because it's a, it's a topic that would consume the entire hour. But I think that lubricants play the major part of this. 85% of the errors we see or failures we see are based to lubricant failure. Uh, the other 15% are scattered between a bunch of different factors. But if you're using a quality lubricant, you're not letting people combine lubricants because if you mix lubricants, it's a real problem. You're not using any light spray oils or penetrating greases, and you don't let your maintenance people come in and spray anything in your breaker ever. If you basically take care of it, use the proper, proper grease and lubricants and keep it clean, uh, you should not have any mechanical issues till you get up to the two or 3,000 operation uh, part and modern vacuum breakers. Like I said earlier, at about 3,000 operations, uh, the world begins to go backwards on you because of uh, bearings, paws, fits, bushings start to wear. And uh, there has to be some pretty heavy maintenance at about 3,000 hours. Excuse me. 3, Finley, how, about, uh, how about breakers that have been in storage for 10 years? And the other question is, how do we regulate uh, the different types of lubricants going into our breakers from service entities? Well, you have to, you have to, pick a service company that you interview and you ask them what they're going to use. And if they're, if they're, if they're not very positive about what they're going to use, if they don't know what they're going to use, you pick their own company. Uh, I can, uh, we can give you, there is a lubricant studies that have been done there. Uh, Tony D Maria and I wrote a paper for Anita and for IEEE a few years ago, where we did a bunch of advanced uh, lubricant aging tests, uh, we can get that to you if you will request it from, from Justin. Uh, but basically, when you, when you hire a maintenance company, you need to interview them. And there's certain questions you need to ask before they lay their hands on your switch gear. The switch gear is just like your relays. When you have a guy come in to calibrate your protective relays, you're very picky about who you use. You need to, use, you need to be very picky about how you use to, to maintain and actually do any work on your medium voltage vacuum breakers because they are just as critical as the relays. I find all the time that a company will go hire a, a professional company that has great qualifications to do their PNC work and their relay calibration, and they'll hire an electric contractor to come in and clean and maintenance their, their breakers. And it may even be a contractor that doesn't have uh, training or the ability really to do the work. So be careful there. Uh, what was the other question? There, there were two yeah. questions. Uh, the other question was, uh, how about breakers that have been stored in storage for 10 years? Yeah. Well, uh, if breakers are kept, uh, you know, clean, okay, they're, they're tested, they're certified, they're running to speed, the vacuum interrupters are checked, and they're kept clean, they're kept in a storage bag, they're kept in a box, and they have some heat on them to keep moisture out, they can be stored for long periods of time. Now, when you do your uh, semi-annual or every five year or whatever maintenance, you need to do the spares as well. So don't forget that. Don't forget the spares. And, and I would cycle them through use. You know, I would at, at every maintenance interval, I would take and move a spare into operation and I would take the other breaker out and put it into spare. And I would do this in my less critical circuits. You know, the spares, if they're not maintained and not reliable, they're of no value to you. They actually hurt you because you're counting on them. And I've seen many times when people say, yeah, we've got a spare and we're out there in a maintenance situation. We go pull it out and it's set in the corner. It wasn't covered. It's completely full of dirt. It's got two or three coffee cups sitting on the top of it. Man, that's not the way to conduct business. Uh, we and lots of people build a bags, heated bags, or you can build heat boxes to put over them, keep a little bit of heat on them to keep the moisture out. Uh, run them through the, the operator. You have an electrical operator on your switchgear. Open, close them periodically. Maintain them. Keep them lubed. 
so you can rely on your spares. There's no problem with keeping a spare breaker sitting inactive for 10 years, as long as it sees it the normal maintenance cycle, just like the rest of the breakers do. So I guess I'm counter countermanding myself, but I would I would I would not have any breaker sit 10 years without operation and rely on it. So I would run it through normal maintenance. Go ahead. Next, any other questions? Yeah, I've got uh, just two quick ones, and then we'll uh, continue on with the presentation. But for spare vacuum breaker breakers, is it better to keep the vacuum bottles in closed position or open position? And also the same question about shipping the breaker. Well, when you're shipping the breaker, uh, is different than absolutely different than storing it. When you're storing it open or closed, is 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 not a big deal. You know, you're you're talking about uh, shipping the breaker. If it's an older breaker that doesn't have spline protection. The newer breakers all have splines built into the contact assemblies and the moving side so that they won't twist, turn, or vibrate. So you don't essentially wear the bellows like the older one. The older breakers that were built, say, in the 70s, 80s, even into the 90s, the problem with shipping the breaker open is that the bellows vibrates at a high frequency the whole time it's driving down the road. And the bellows is only a few mils thick of stainless steel and it can't stand that. So you need to you put you need to block it closed or close the breaker if you're going to ship an interrupter or you need to put some blocking material in it where the bellows isn't going to move if you ship a loose interrupter. So absolutely shipping a vacuum breaker if it's not one of the modern breakers where it's splined. The new breakers have a spline in the moving contact assembly and it and it adds rigidity and you don't get the vibration and the frequency and the damage to the to the bellows. Was there something else? Uh, so I got one more in the chat. It says, is it safe to say a regular rotation with spares into operation with, the, with an existing circuit is a good idea? Uh, I think you just answered that. It's a great idea. You know, these are mechanical devices. Uh, the longer they sit inactive, the more apt they are to have problems. So if you can rotate them through your normal breaker maintenance program and rotate the other breakers out, that have the highest operations. I was at a uh, power plant, uh, LCRA power plant a few years ago, and they had spare breakers sitting on the side that had uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 operations on them that were 20 years old. And they had breakers in service with 3000 operations on them. What kind of sense does that make? It makes no sense. So you need to get these high operation breakers out and get these uh, breakers with very few operations in service. And, uh, they did have a catastrophic failure and it was one of the high inter interrupting breakers. And that's another, that's another story, but it, it's a good one. Let's move forward or we're not going to get through the material. Well, I don't guess I'm going to, if my machine won't run. There we go. We talked about this already, but lubricant is really the lifeblood of the breaker. And that's where most of the errors come from. It, it ages and thickens with time. Don't let it be mixed or contaminated with other lubricants because of the bases and the lubricants will attack each other. There's chemical reactions and hardening that takes places and it's just catastrophic to the breaker. So be sure your maintenance company understands what's in the breaker and they use the same lubricant. If not, you know, take a, a, a popsicle stick, take a sample, and make sure it's analyzed and they use the same lube. The alternative to that is to clean all the lube out and start with something you know and convert all your breakers to a, a modern lubricant that's available. I know that's harder, it's hard work, but it has to be done. Okay. Contaminants are a big deal dust, dirt, all sorts of things, you know, spider webs, uh, corrosive materials. If you're close to the ocean, you know, salt water. Uh, set, basically, chlorides are the death to stainless steel, you know. People think stainless steel, stainless steel, it's not. You get a chloride close to it, it'll punch right through it in a matter of time. So make sure these are closed, they're clean, vacuum interrupters are clean, all the stainless is clean. Make sure there is no chloride-based cleansers used, no citrus-type cleaners used in cleaning your switch gear or your circuit breakers. You know, high temperature is a problem to grease. Uh, varying temperature is a problem to your breaker, so you have to consider temperature. Incompatible lubricants is one of the biggest problems. That's not true. The biggest problem is people doing maintenance on the breaker that damage your breaker that don't know what they're doing. The next biggest problem would be incompatible lubricants or a lack of lubricant. Uh, industry standard maintenance cycles. This is directly out of the NEDA uh, 
maintenance standards that can be picked up uh, right from the internet with National Electrical Testing Association. Basically, they give you a chart, a graph, a ex explanation for every class of equipment, what they recommend for maintenance. A lot of people with a lot of experience in the field put these charts and these, these tables together. So do not discount it. This is not something one person came up with. NIDA has uh, thousands and thousands of years of experience in maintaining electrical equipment. And all of that went into developing these standard maintenance intervals. And it's something you should consider. And if you're operating outside of these, let's just say that NIDA says you should uh, maintain this equipment every year, every a visual inspection, and you're not doing that, you probably need to go back and rethink and justify why you're not using this particular standard because this is uh, these are very uh, well thought out. Let's talk about white force. I want to talk about some things today that people don't normally consider. White force is the amount of pressure that all circuit breakers, vacuum air, oil, anything, so they have a, a white force spring that maintains pressure and holds the contacts together. If it's an air breaker, it holds it closed. If it's a vacuum breaker, it's essentially holding pressure. This pressure is very important because when you have a through fault or you have a, a, an event, that stops the, the contacts from popping. So let's just say that you have a, 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 a through fault and the breaker pops. When it pops, it opens uh, all three phases, one phase or two phases uh, randomly, meaning they don't operate in sequence. When they do that, you develop feral resonance problems throughout your plant that damage transformers, damage motors, twist cores, twist cables, flop cables, break splices, all sorts of things happen when you get an imbalance. That's why breakers have to be timed to where they open and close within two milliseconds of each other so you escape this feral resonance issue. Think about a dry type transformer, a big dry type transformer, 3,750 kVA, 15 kV class transformer. It's designed to be able to hit all three phases simultaneously so the magnetic stresses don't damage the, if you get single phase or you hit one phase before the other two, the whole core tries to twist and you damage the breaker, excuse me, you damage the transformer. So popping forces cause that. So it's very important to maintain proper pressure. People don't check that. Most shops don't check that. They just expect that it's gonna do that. The way the manufacturer guarantees it does is they supply you a wear standard. So we're talking today primarily about modern breakers, vacuum breakers, not air breakers, but you get a wear spec that says, hey, when these contacts wear X amount, there's normally two pointers. And it says, when this exceeds this, the, con the breaker can be fairly new, the contact, uh, the vacuum interrupter can still have a substantially good vacuum inside of it, but what the contact resistance can still be good, but what's happened is you've exceeded the wear limit, which means the spring can no longer exert proper white spring force on the contacts. So it's very important you watch your wear limiters. Every breaker in the instruction book, it'll have two lines aligned. It says when they're misaligned, replace it or it can be like this and it says whenever it reaches here replace it sometimes you have to physically measure with a scale every instruction book for every circuit breaker tells you how to measure where where is the number one killer of a vacuum interrupter when they reach their wear limit they need to be replaced if they're not you can't maintain proper wipe that means when you do have a fault the breaker is not going to perform and protect the circuit correctly so basically maintain that force Make sure those blow off or popping forces don't come into play. Check the wear on your vacuum interrupters at every maintenance cycle. When they approach that limit, replace them. There are tools and spring gauges for checking uh, wipe springs. Not a bad idea. If, uh, if the breaker shop that you're using doesn't know what you're talking about, you probably got the wrong breaker shop. White forces are very high. For instance, uh, you know, four to eight, four to 800 pounds of pressure in a particular ML13 breaker. So that spring has to have a four to 800 pounds of pressure. And it has to also be able to enact over an entire range. So it's very difficult to check those white, white springs. And as long as the breaker is within wear and you're fewer than 3000 operations, very seldom you see a white spring problem. This is what we're talking about. When you get beyond 3,000 operations, the white springs are the sort of things that have to be replaced. Here's the, uh, for instance, what we're talking about. If you look 
right here, you can see the wear indicator. So when this particular disc reaches here, the interrupter needs to be replaced. This is the wipe spring below it, the spring that's in yellow. I guess that's yellow, I'm pretty colorblind. Basically, whenever that wipe spring can continue to do its job up to about 3000 operations after that, I would have those wipe springs checked. That's part, it should be part of a major maintenance, major overhaul that should happen at about 3000 operations with most air breakers, vacuum breakers, particularly this particular GE breaker here that we're talking about that has a tremendous amount of force. This breaker produces about 1200 foot pounds of force onto the vacuum interrupters. It's a very big, strong mechanism. We talked about clearing time earlier. Basically that's parting, that's the uh, non-intentional delay in the breaker because you hit trip. There's some time that goes by mechanically before the trip latch drops or pulls and enables the uh, trip spring to start to act. So that is the mechanical time delay. Then there's parting time, there's acceleration, there's bounce, there's bowing the arc, extinguishing the arc in an air breaker. In a vacuum breaker, it's simply uh, the amount of the mechanical delay, the breaker the contacts in the vacuum interrupter move very, a very small distance, let's just say 10, 12 millimeters. In that amount of time at next crossing zero, which is less than one cycle, uh, you'll, the, they will part. So you have the mechanical delay and the delay in the interrupter, those two combined have to operate within three to five cycles because they build a three cycle interrupting breaker and they build a five cycle interrupting breaker. Depending on your application, you will have either receive three cycle or five cycle breakers. The majority of them are five cycle opening devices and medium voltage breakers, but every manufacturer does build a three cycle breaker. We talked about the importance of timing earlier when we got off topic a little bit. <clears throat> Clearing time is very important because that is used in the calculations for your arc flash study. You've had to do these studies, you've had to placard, you've had to train your people, you've had to equip your people. If, you, if the breakers do not operate to speed, none of those numbers matter and your people are not protected. OSHA has recently written in, uh, or not recently, but they, they do ask you to prove uh, that the breakers will operate to time and speed, and that can only be done with a timer. Uh, accurate timing is very important. Without accurate timing, you don't know what the speeds are. You don't know if the breaker will actually do its job. There are insulation tests. Uh, there are vacuum integrity tests. There are tests that test the pressure inside the vacuum interrupter. There, the timing test actually gives you the best reflected relationship to health of your mechanism. There is also vibration techniques with uh, our circuit breaker analyzer. Other people have vibration analysis equipment that will give you the mechanical condition of the breaker. But really the timer is your, is your really proof test. If the breaker is operating to speed, and believe it or not, if it sounds right, uh, you know, uh, I would say that you're, you have a healthy mechanism, you have a healthy breaker. So speed and velocity, or at least speed and parting time is your best indicator to the mechanical condition of your breaker. Obviously, nothing will ever replace a set of eyes and a good visual inspection. If it's not clean, you know, it's full of mouse droppings, you know, it's full of fur balls, spider webs, uh, you see burnt or charred or uh, pieces or components that have been hot. Visual inspection is very important, guys. You know, you, it's really as important as anything. So make sure that a good visual inspection is done. Everything is cleaned very well properly and everything is lubed very well properly. Then do all your mechanical electrical tests after all that inspection and cleaning is done. Uh, the vacuum interrupter replacement we talked earlier about that it's very easy to keep the switch gear in service 100 years, it's just steel. Uh, the bussing inside can be cleaned and retorqued, it's just copper. You can replace the instrument transformers, the control wiring and upgrade the relaying pretty easily. You know, there's all kinds of modern relays that are just wonderful. I'm not a proponent of that, I'm still an old electromechanical guy, but uh, you, you can't you can't underestimate the efficiency of modern solid state relays. So you can basically keep the switch gear in service because relays, potential transformers and wire are available 
the actual structure is steel and copper, as long as you have non-hygroscopic insulating materials and you keep the moisture out, your switch gear will live longer than we will. How do you keep the vacuum breaker or the air breaker in service for that hundred years is the problem. With the vacuum breakers, you keep the mechanism in condition, you time it, you test it, you keep it lubed. Every, say, 3,000 operations, you do major maintenance on it. Uh, you don't let it set still for a longer period than about five years. Now, the reason for that is, okay, everybody out here, do something for me. Every, and, and I know this sounds corny. Just do it for me. Take your hands, push them right here. Push as hard as you can, okay, as hard as you can. Now, I want you to hold that for five years. Then when I say part in five years, I want you to do that at the same speed you can do it right now. That's what you're asking your breaker to do. You're asking it to hold a thousand foot pounds of pressure for five years and then operate as if you operated it in a few seconds. That is a lubrication issue. It's a mechanical issue that's hard to overcome. You're asking a breaker to maintain a thousand foot pounds of pressure against itself and against the springs and then react as if it was only a few seconds closed, yet it may have been closed five to 10 years. That's the problem. So in order to do that, you have to do all this other work. So replacing the vacuum interrupters at some point is gonna be inevitable. You know, if you take the standard leak rate of a vacuum interrupter, which is about three times 10 to the minus seventh PA per week, three times 10 to the minus seven PA per week. That's the standard design leak rate, anticipated or target leak rate of a vacuum interrupter at a vacuum interrupter factory. If you take that and extrapolate from minus five PA, which is about where it's manufactured to failure, which is somewhere just above, just below minus one, the math comes out to 29 years. So the standard leak rate says it should survive 29 years. That's if it's manufactured correctly, it's seen no thermal overload and everything operates correctly. And we see interrupters that live in excess of that, okay? Uh, I'll be honest with you, uh, Mitsubishi interrupters live a hell of a long time. Their leak rate's very low. Uh, some of the other manufacturers have low leak rates. Some have very high leak rates. And the newer manufactured interrupters have much higher leak rates than they had 15 or 20 years ago. So uh, getting that leak rate information or just simply planning to replace the interrupters at say 30 years is a really good idea. Now in critical circuits, uh, I would be very cautious uh, going beyond that period. If it's powering the parking lot lights, you know, maybe you can afford a failure there as long as it doesn't damage the equipment, smoke up the equipment or shut down a critical circuit or hurt somebody. With current advancements and widespread availability, these vacuum interrupters are out there. You know, there's several manufacturers building replacement interrupters. You can still go to the manufacturer and get both of them. You know, you need to have them tested and at some point. When I first got in this business, I saw one failure maybe a month, two. Now we see 20, 30, 40 a day. That's the difference. That's the acceleration of, of that curve. And if we have time, we'll go back to it and look at it later. Here you see a modern interrupter on the left, an older interrupter on the right, and you see the pinch tube on the top, and you see the interrupter is made out of leaded glass. So the leaded glass is penetrated by small noble gases. The pinch tube can't be sealed as very well. That's why it's got all that epoxy daubed on the top. I don't think I would trust that. So the pinch tube breakers are pretty high uh, leak rate. The modern interrupters are built inside a, a vacuum furnace. They're assembled and brazed in one shot method. So there's no pinch tube on them. So typically modern interrupters are, are pretty good. Uh, but there again, you're, uh, we do see quite a few fail directly out. And you do see a lot of the Chinese stuff that comes in and does not, that has a very high leak rate. So there, there are some terrors on the, on, the, on the edge of the world here. Absolutely, uh, there are manufacturers, Siemens, ABB, uh, Mitsubishi, for instance, uh, Hyundai, uh, that have very low leak rates and I feel very good about. Probably shouldn't have said that. Uh, vacuum interrupters have gotten smaller over the years. If you look at this, the one on the right, the one on the left are the same rating. So don't be surprised when you see a, a replacement breaker or a, a vacuum interrupter or a new breaker that has very small interrupters with a high interrupting rating. Because as you can see uh, over the years, the standard interrupter has, has uh, shrunk, 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 and they're gonna continue to get smaller as, as everything does. 
leak rate testing we can talk about. It's, uh, it's something that there are, there are several manufacturers now building pinning-based leak rate detectors that can tell you the actual leak rate inside your vacuum interrupters and give you the actual pressure that's inside them. Uh, really nice technology, really nice tool. Currently, this is in the need of standards as an approved alternative to uh, uh, AC testing with the uh, uh, normal instruction book method. You know, the vacuum, that particular test where you apply a potential is the acid test, okay? So no matter what test you use, DC, uh, anything, uh, basically before I tear that breaker down, I would put an AC high pot on it and run the go, no go test, the very basic vacuum integrity test. That only tells you if the interrupter is good today. It doesn't tell you if it'll, what it's going to do in the future. Uh, the pinning discharge test essentially gives you the vacuum pressure today. Then you can get another spot in a couple of years and you can trend to failure. But the real acid test is the AC high pot uh, vacuum integrity test. Be careful there. Uh, if once you reach near the failure point, you can get false negatives, false positives. Uh, so if it does show you a failure, believe it. And then if it shows you a pass after it, don't believe it. Uh, newer breakers have embedded poles, uh, poles that are not assembled. The vacuum interrupter is encased in epoxy, for instance. Those are very stable. That's a very good technology. Those poles are available for a lot of breakers that had assembled poles on them. They have a high dielectric strength. They have a lot of overload capability. Spider webs, bugs, moisture can't get to them. Really good idea if you're gonna be specifying new vacuum breakers to make sure they're uh, embedded uh, type poles and not an assembled type pole. Uh, that uh, it, it's a big difference in overall longevity and performance. As you see here, there are replacement poles, like on the left is an assembled pole and the center is a replacement embedded pole. And you can see this GE breaker has the Im embedded poles have been placed on it. So if you go to buy new poles for your breaker, someone, if you can get, an, uh, get rid of the assembled poles, the epoxy embedded poles is a better way to go. The embedded pole essentially has the same vacuum interrupter in it, it's the same structure. It's just essentially cast in a block of epoxy which does a lot of good things for you. Okay, so uh, the conclusion is, and, and, and if you get a copy of the paper, the paper is 15 pages and it'll, it'll explain all this to you in more detail. And if you go through the paper, yellow line, what you're concerned about, you can get a hold of us and we'd be glad to explain it to you. We only have a certain amount of time to breeze through this here and take questions. Basically, the breakers were originally designed for a 20-year life. I don't believe that, but that's what it says. That was, the, that was the salespeople talking because the salespeople want it out every 20 years, and they want you to buy new switchgear. I think the switchgear will survive 100 years, okay, 100 years plus, and it has to today because we don't have anything to replace it. There's no silver bullet coming quick right now that's going to replace vacuum breaker technology. So we have to keep this gear in service. The other reason we have to keep it in service are actually two reasons is the gear was installed and now equipment has been built around it and it's hard to get out now, okay? Number two is the equipment was installed and the cables were run to it. And if you go in and bend these cables, disconnect them, flake them back, pull the old switch gear off, install new switch gear, chances are you've damaged the cable. These cables have been set in steel for 30, 40, 50 years and physically moving, flexing these cables, disturbing these cables is a very bad idea. Because you think it's expensive and difficult to replace the switch gear, try to it, it replace two miles of armored cable or buried cable in your plant. Uh, now you're talking about real money and real downtime. So be very careful of disturbing these cables, especially older cables, if you do have to go in and remove the switch gear. Many of these breakers are approaching 40 years old. We're gonna to have to have 50 more years of service out of them. Uh, you know, keys for the, for the life extension, industry maintenance strategies. There again, pick someone you trust, pick their plan, work the plan. I'm gonna tell you that I believe in the things that are in NIDA, I had something to do with them. There are all kinds of maintenance strategies out there for this electrical equipment. Carefully review them, pick the one that fits you, your budget and your plan. Obviously, a, uh, a submerged arc furnace and a phosphorus plant, the maintenance on that's way different than the maintenance on a 15 kV dry type transformer in a big building. 
So it has to be subject to some uh, criticality. Uh, determine the remaining life of your interrupters and your breakers and your switchgear and put together a capital plan to upgrade what you can. You know, the relaying, the CTs, the PTs, uh, insulating material. If you've got stuff built in the 80s, you've got a lot of hygroscopic stuff in there that'll absorb moisture. Get the bus bracing out and the bus uh, tubing out that it's organic. Get that stuff out of your switch gear or you're going to get bit by it. Uh, keep the breakers well maintained, well lubricated, well tested, and that solves most of these other problems. Verify your trip times occasionally. Put that into your specifications where you know the health of the mechanism. The mechanism is the most important thing and lubrication is key there. Maintenance intervals, I'm gonna recommend not exceeding five years before you do this testing. I know some people do, it's a bad idea, okay? Uh, that's all I've got today. That's a very quick overview of this paper. Uh, email, uh, reach out to Justin if you want a copy of it, we'll get it to you. If you want any of the other information we talked about during this particular presentation, you know, reach out to me, we'll get it to you. Now we've got uh, a few minutes. Uh, any questions, you can get them to Justin. I'd be glad to address them. Thank you, Finley. Uh, you know, one, I have some really good compliments coming in. People seem to really enjoy the presentation. Uh, it felt like uh, one hour, it felt like 10 minutes. So that's a very good sign. Uh, a couple questions coming in. I've got one from Lewis here. He says, hi, what is the frequency? What does, what does the frequency have to do with the speed test? Uh, what does frequency I'm sorry. of what, what frequency should we do for speed tests or I guess timing tests? There you go. There you go. Well, it's very quick. Okay. Uh, uh, breaker timing testing is very quick. If you have a modern timer and you have one that has, that's integrated, uh, uh, where you don't have to hook up a separate power supply and, and uh, use a bunch of alligator clips. So if you, if you have it set up, you can time the breakers in just a, a couple of minutes. So there's no reason not to do it, uh, especially a parting test. You can do it in a couple of minutes. You can't do a time velocity and travel test in a couple of minutes. Maybe you would do that on critical circuits occasionally, but the basic parting test tells you everything you need to know from a maintenance standpoint. And I would do it every time you maintain the breaker, every time you look at the breaker, which I would say is every less than every five years. Basically, okay. when things start to go sideways with you from lubrication or from a contaminant standpoint uh, or a spring or anything, it'll show up in that timing test. If the breaker, and I keep saying this, and I know it sounds squirrely, but if it sounds, if every breaker, if you open and you have 30 breakers in your plant, you pull them out, you pull maintenance, and they all sound the same, that's good. You've got one that makes a funny sound, man, think about it. Go investigate it. There, there's something to that. Basically, you can see breakers that have a problem that still run to speed and, and listen to these breakers. They'll tell you something. It's just like listening to your car run. If you've got a hot rod or a motorcycle, you, you can tell there's a problem with it. If you hear something, you think you hear something, put a spare in it, send that one out to a qualified shop and find out what the issue is. It's not worth a failure because a catastrophic failure can not only take that circuit, it can take the two circuits beside it with it. That's three sections of switch gear down. That's at the minimum four, five, six days of outage. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, does recorded leaking va current value from the AC high pot test set during field testing of vacuum bottles mean anything? No. This I, number gets bigger on the next maintenance cycle. Does it mean anything? No. And the reason is the humidity, skin, you have a certain amount of current that's passing around the outside of the skin of the interrupter. You have a certain amount of, ener of energy that's going through the air around the interrupter. Uh, the, the humidity, the temperature, the contaminants on the interrupter, how it was cleaned, there are all sorts of things that happen. As the interrupter opens and closes, it creates a metal vapor. That metal vapor is spun and deposits inside the interrupters. So basically that is also conducting energy around the inside of the interrupter. There are too many factors. Uh, whoever asked that question, I have a paper to send where we actually studied that. If you'll get their name, Justin, we can send him, we can send them that paper. Okay. People, right, have tried, uh, people have tried pull force. They've tried current. They've tried all sorts of things. They've tried acoustics. Uh, I've tried all these things, to be honest with you. The only thing that works is the same thing they use at the factory, which is the pinning discharge test. 
That's the, what's what they use at the factory to design, build, and test the interrupters. It's the same thing we use in the field. It's the same thing you should use. Go ahead. Is it possible to identify a bad vacuum tube prior to opening the breaker? This gentleman had one about five years ago, uh, arc to ground uh, due to a bad vacuum tube, but we didn't know until the breaker was opened. If you open the breaker offload, uh, you're not going to have that problem. Then you can test it. If it's if you're opening it with uh, any a big charging circuit, for instance, a long cable or something, then you you understand the failure you can have there. There's no way there's no way to test the breaker for loss of vacuum with it closed in the in the in the circuit prior currently. But if you use the pinning test, you would have picked that up at the last maintenance cycle and you would have known not to put it back into service because the pinning principle will tell you, do you have two years, five years, 10 years, or 20 years service life left in the interrupter? That interrupter would have come back and told you at the last maintenance cycle to replace it. So it essentially would have solved the problem for you. All right, Ian asks, do you recommend partial discharge testing in service? Do I recommend partial discharge testing? Absolutely, but uh, there's a domain for partial discharge. You know, um, you know, uh, 15 kV and higher cable, absolutely a valid and proper and great test. Uh, metal clad switch gear with a TEV sensor, great test. Lower voltages, forget it. Uh, and there are, you know, some things that transformers and uh, certain environments that are too noisy, even with modern signal processing. processing. But uh, cable, testing splices, uh, terminations, long runs of cable, partial discharge at above 15 kV is great. It, it, it's the way to go. It's the preferred method. Uh, a TEV sensor can detect all kinds of ionizing, excuse me, uh, all sorts of breakdowns for uh, corona and partial discharge in switchgear well in advance. So uh, TEV testing is a great idea. That skin effect small amount picocoulombs of energy going to ground through the insulation. And that's a great test for metal clad switch gear. And there's also a RF method in partial discharge by which you can triangulate through four antennas in the switch gear room and pinpoint where that test, where that failure is coming from. I've had great uh, luck in finding uh, corona and partial discharge failures, uh, tracking for instance, you know, that sort of thing in switch gear with uh, partial discharge testing with TEV sensor. Uh, acoustically, I've had great success and with the RF method. So for switch gear, it's TEV for, uh, for cable, you know, it's high frequency CT and basic PD testing is, 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 is great technology. Great. I see if we got one more coming in. Uh, what, what's the model of circuit breaker timer that you would recommend? Uh, everybody makes a timer. Okay. Everybody makes a timer. Uh, some of them are very expensive and they typically have the ability to feed travel and distance and velocity information into the result. If you're looking just to do a parting test, which is the minimum I would recommend, uh, there are uh, lots of them out there that'll do it. And, you know, it, get with me offline and I'll, I'll give you the pros and cons of all of them. Uh, any of them is better than doing nothing. There are simple handheld timers that do a great job. There are complex timers, but you shouldn't pay, you know, you, there's no reason to go buy a $40,000 timer if you're not going to use it on 100 kV outdoor breakers and do a lot of travel. All you need is an inexpensive timer to do 38 kV and below switch gear. So, you know, reach out to Justin, get my phone number. Matter of fact, I think I've got it. I got a few couple more slides. I just thought about it. There you go, right there. That's got my phone number on it. It's got my email address on it. If you want to send me an email or a text or whatever, I'll get back to you on the timer problem. There's, there's everybody builds one. There's five or six models out there that'll do the job. I'm partial to a couple of them. I don't really want to hawk anybody's equipment right here. What else? Uh, is there any trick to easily open or close a vacuum circuit breaker to perform timing tests? Wiring harness is not always available. Yes, there is. Same thing. Most timers, most timers have the ability to open and close the breaker. Some timers integrate the factory plugs in the back. So you just stick it on the primary, on the secondary, and you can function test the breaker as well as time it. 
Uh, people build also little control boxes for doing that. Uh, you can open and close it either with a manual charging handle or you can open and charge it by connecting to the primary using uh, a primary, excuse me, secondary using a secondary connector. There, that again, reach out to us. We, we can help you with that. All right. It looks like we're right at uh, the hour, Finley. Uh, thank you for this presentation today. If you have additional questions, I have posted my email address in the chat box. It's jgaull at cbsarcsafe.com. Uh, we'll look at uh, additional questions that have come in. We can handle that through email. And just to let you know, I mean, Group CBS is you know, three divisions. We have CBS Field Services, CBS Power Products, and Circuit Breaker Sales, uh, all fitting a wide variety. There we go, Finley. Uh, of of um, electrical needs and we're located throughout the US and um, in a market near you. So, you know, let us know if you have questions, uh, we will filter it out to the right people and get your questions answered. And uh, again, thank you for attending. We are gonna post this to our YouTube channel. So keep your eye out for Group CBS and our YouTube channel. We'll send the link to everybody that is registered. Finley, sir, anything else? Thanks a lot for uh, joining. Uh, had a couple hundred people here, had a great eclectic group, a lot of users, a lot of people I know. Uh, I look forward to seeing y'all possibly at the Nita Convention in Orlando this year, or maybe the Double Convention. Let's uh, let's do good work. Let's take care of the equipment. Let's advance our field. Uh, let's be good guys. Uh, let's be uh, stewards of this equipment and give value to our customers. Thank you very much. We're off. <laughs>